But proper, proper mode for Bible study, of course, is confession of sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, overt sins. Why? Can't study the Bible in carnality, can't apply it in carnality. So what you learn about confession of sin to study the Bible is how you, what you learn how to live it. So mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins need to be examined and confessed before study so that the Holy Spirit can teach according to John 14, 26. That's an amazing passage. You should, you should study that passage. It basically says that when the Holy Spirit teaches you something and puts it in your heart, he is able to recall it on the spur of the moment. Just think about that. I mean, you know, you run into somebody, you've studied all this stuff, and then you run into somebody that got an issue, and, and you, your mind immediately goes like, I have an answer for it. And then you, then you begin to stumble over, well, where is that? I know I have it. If you just relax and say, say to the Holy Spirit, give me that. I know it's there. So recall that, and boy, he'll do it. That's an amazing, that's an amazing thing. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Give you that exercise. And so, our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way in a stormy Sunday. I mean, you know, I've been on both sides of that. On the farmer's side, we always prayed for rain. So I know there's probably some farmers glad to see this rain come as they look for spring harvest as far as preparing the ground. I know we always got excited in March and April. So I pray today, Father, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth of the Word of God. Today we look at an interesting subject, Father, out of Genesis in our study of the tree of life. What's interesting to me, Father, about it is that you put it on both ends of the Bible. You put it in Genesis and you put it in Revelation. And that's pretty amazing to me. And so, I, Father, we would learn a great deal about that today because while we didn't see the tree of knowledge in our earthly stay, we will see it in our heavenly stay. So teach us today the importance of it in the great plan of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in an interesting subject. We're in a book. We're studying the first Toledoth of Genesis. Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, divided into two manuscripts, the creation story in Genesis 1-1 one, one through the second chapter, verse 3. And then he broke the, the rest of the book of Genesis into 11 Toledoths. And uh, so we're in the first one, that's Genesis um, 2, 4 through the fourth chapter. Uh, we've been there a while. We've been there a couple weeks. Uh, of course, I'm being facetious. And I don't know how long we've been there since I've been out here, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I've been there a long time, but because we, it's important. The book of Genesis, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, makes the rest of the book important. Everything you learn in the first 11 chapters, the rest of the Bible, now you have a foundation to understand the rest of the Bible and human history, and that's pretty amazing. Well, here we are. We're in the third chapter, uh, and we're in verses 22 through 24. I, I think when I get through the first Toledoth, I'm going to take a break from Genesis. I'm moving so slow with it, move something else. Then I'll come back later to it. Uh, here we are in verse 22. Then the Lord said, <clears throat> you know, we've had Adam ate from the tree and dying, they, you shall die, has been committed unto them. The consequences for their sin has been dealt with. <clears throat> and now we're at 22. Uh, they, they have made garments, they were naked, 
And so they've been covered, we'll talk about that today, they've been covered with, with garments, uh, the robes of righteousness through animal sacrifice and the blood of Christ in shadow Christology through t verse 21. When we get to verse 22 through 24, we run into the tree of life. I don't mean literally run into it, but I mean we, we find it. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might, watch this now, and now, see, because he's committed sin, now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, you know, therefore is why for, now he's going to explain, therefore the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. At the east end of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and a flaming sword, which turns in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. There's the tree of life in the book of Genesis. When we come back to the second hour, I'm going to talk about the tree of life that's in the book of Revelation. The tree of life. So we'll get, we'll cover this subject matter uh, pretty well in today, first session, second session. In Genesis 2.9, in Genesis 2.9, we were introduced to the tree of knowledge when, it, when, he, when Moses wrote, God planted the tree of life in the Garden of Eden in 2.9. When he did it, he mentioned four categories of trees in the Garden of Eden. Four categories of trees in the Garden of Eden. There were trees that were pleasant to the sight. There was a tree good, trees good for food. There was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right? Three categories of trees in the garden. This, was, this is in the period of human history that's called innocence. In other words, there was, no, there was no Adam's sin and there was no sin nature. Man was in a perfect state of existence in his humanity. We call it, in theology, we call it a period of innocence. All right? We've talked about that. Now that's in Genesis 2.9. When we get to Genesis 2.15, we're told that God put man, that's perfect man in innocence, in the garden, which was a perfect garden of environment, in the period of what theology calls innocence. And his job was to cultivate and keep it. Now that was a cush job, wouldn't you agree? It was perfect ground. I mean, we'd all like that job. We wouldn't like the job that he got later where he had to do the same thing with thorns and thistles. We wouldn't like that job. But this was a, a perfect job for a perfect guy in a perfect environment uh, with a perfect God. When we get to Genesis 2, the 16th and 17th verses, God issued two commands as part of one. He issued two commands, one command, what he could do, and one commandment of what he could not do. That's in Genesis 2, 16, 17, which we've studied. In verse 16, he's told what he can do. In verse 17, he's told what he cannot do. You can eat from all the trees in the garden except one. You can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then he gave them this warning, in the day you eat, dying you will die. Muth, muth. We've studied that. All right? What man could not do was to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the very day they did, dying they would die. In other words, he identified two deaths, physical and spiritual. After Moses, after Adam ate from the tree, 
he lived 930 years. What dying, dying you will die. What was the first dying? We know the last one was physical, so what was the first one? If you, right? Spiritual. And we know it because of the way they reacted when they ate it. They went into hiding, they went into blaming, and you know the story of, of that. They felt naked in the presence of God. They were hiding from the presence of God. They wanted nothing to do with the presence of God. Shame. shame, yeah, shame. Then the next time we read about the tree, of, I'm just looking at the tree of life. The next time, see, a lot of people don't even know it's even mentioned that many times in the book of Genesis. The next time we read it, in the third chapter, we're in verses 22 through 24, which I just read. This is following uh, Adam's sin, the next time we read it, we're, we're into this. We're now, they're not permitted to eat from the tree of knowledge. In fact, they're evicted from the Garden of Eden. Huh? Uh huh. I want, in our first hour, as we look at the tree in the period of innocence in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> I want us to look at five things this morning as we look at the tree in the Garden of Eden. The period of innocence before Adam ate from that tree, that, the period of innocence is the most unique and amazing period of human history ever. Now you just stop and think about it. In that period of human history, there was no sin. There was no sin nature. There was perfect environment. There was perfect everything. Perfect ground. Perfect everything was perfect. In, in the true state, if you say, well, what about geography? It was perfect. What about Andrew? Everything was perfect. There has never been a period. Of, listen, even the millennium, is a pretty amazing period. Would you agree with that? Where God begins to reverse the roles of things, of, of nature. You know, the lion will lay down with the lamb and all this. Yet in the millennial age, while it's an amazing age of a thousand years, nothing compares with the period of innocence. And yet that's the first period of human history. Isn't that interesting? When you look at the, when you look at human, the existence of, of human history, there's never been a period ever like this period. And they got evicted from it. What in the world were they thinking? What force was in the world at that time that would cause this wonderful couple living in perfect everything to give all that up? What power was present in the period of innocence that would cause this couple to bankrupt everything? You know what it was? Satan. 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 Yeah, he was present in the garden, wasn't he? But who talked to Eve? Other than God. <laughs> All right, who talked to Eve? Who convinced her? You think he's still around? Huh? He thinks, you think he's around your garden? Huh? You suppose he makes cold calls? <laughs> uh, as well as hot ones. Do you know how to prevent him from destroying your marriage? Do you know how to prevent him from destroying your family, your church, your community, your business? Do you know how to do that? 
Do what? Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word. Mm, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Listen. The Word's the answer. But listen, you can have the Word and still be disobedient, right? Did Adam know the Word? Yes. Did Eve know the Word? Did they violate it? Yes. Well, hello, congregation. You know, how, you know how we got them? Because they have volition. They have the truth. And the truth will set you free. It'll set you free from his lies. They still took his bait. See, it's one thing to know the truth. The other one is to live it, isn't it? To live it. That's where the rubber hits the pavement. You can know the Word of God and not live it. It can affect your life in a terrible way. It can affect your marriage in a terrible way. It can affect your children in a terrible way. It can affect your business in a terrible way. It can affect your church in a terrible way. It can affect you in a terrible way. In the period of innocence, the devil prowled around, prowled around, 1 Peter 5, 8, write it on your paper. What, you didn't bring a pencil? We gave you a sheet of paper, come on. 1 Peter 5, 8. One of the things the devil does in every period of human history is prowl around. He prowls around He's hunting for prey. He's a lion on the hunt. You understand that? Looking for someone to what? Devour. Devour. You know, that's having you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And maybe a little leftover for breakfast the next day. Devour means I want it all. I want all of you. He'll start... By nibbling on your ear, and the first thing you know, you're down, he's down to your foot because he's eating everything else. You cannot eat, write this down, Ephesians 4.27, you must not give him a foot foothold in your life. You don't let him in the front door, the back door, he doesn't slide through the window, you don't let him in. Sorry, this house is occupied. The Lord lives here. And you know who will run? The devil will run. My, my, my. You know that? If I told you anything you didn't know when you walked in, I doubt it. Let me tell you, you are prey. P-R-E-Y, you are prey for the devil, and only you can consent. But I want you to know he's on the prowl. He's looking for game. Make sure it's not you. Make sure it's not me. So point number one, we've been talking about this that this period of innocence was the most unique period in all of human history. It is a greater period than the millennium. It was a period of perfect environment without time or age. Think about that. Without a time, without time or age, it was a period without mortal or immortal. How do you know it wasn't, didn't have time? Because time didn't start with Adam until he sinned, agreed? What do you think he started counting down to 190? When he died. It's all about dying. You see, devil's all, listen, the devil's all about dying and God's all about living. Now, it was a period without mortal or immortal, without perishable and imperishable. It was a period without spiritual death or spiritual life. Without, without Adam's sin, without a sin nature, this was a wonderful period. Point number two. Before Adam and Eve, and Eve violated the commandment of don't eat, Genesis 
They could eat from the tree of life. He said, Look, he, listen, there's two commandments. They're part of one. In verse 16, you can eat from any tree you want, right? Verse 17, except one. Now, in it, Eris, they had, there, there was four trees. They had, they had privilege to three, and they couldn't do one, and yet they, they took the one. <laughs> they tell you something about man. Uh, well, I don't know. Tells you something about Adam, doesn't it? He chose the one. He chose the tree. He told, was told not to choose. He had three others he could choose from. Ah, oh, my, my, my. Genesis two seventeen. Watch this. In Genesis two seventeen, there's a plurality of death. In the Hebrew, it says "muth muth," dying you shall die. Muth muth. In Genesis five five, after Adam ate, he lived nine hundred and thirty years. See, you, you actually don't have birthdays, you have death days. But you can't sell cards or cakes with that idea. Violation of Genesis 2.17, Adam's original sin, was the cause of the end of the greatest period of human history ever, the period of innocence. Point number three. In pre-fallen humanity... In pre-fallen humanity, come on, my big guy. My clock did the same thing. My clock did the same thing this morning. If it hadn't been for my car phone that said I was an hour late, Everywhere I was going, I too would have been like, well, we're so glad you're, you're here, my man. We are so happy. In pre-fall, I'm in point number three. Will he share your paper with him? That, huh? But he's got William. Ah, William. Get on that horse, William. William is all over it. In pre-fallen humanity, in pre-fallen humanity, the tree of life provided, watch this now, it provided immoral life to a perfect body. As described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 58, you should write uh, sometime in your study, write two columns, write... Um, The body is sown and the body is raised. And, and put everything that Paul talks about in these two columns. And you'll be pretty amazed. It's a study within itself. Well, uh, let's, let's just take a look. Let's take, take a look. This, this whole 15 chapter is pretty dynamite, but, but I think all of them are so. He said, he, he says, uh, the resurrection of the dead. He's going to talk about, and on your paper, I want you to do a personal study next week. You're going to be excited about this. You are really going to like this. On one side, put the word sown. On the other side of the paper, do raised. And watch what, and, and you can see how he does this, how Paul does this. Watch this. He said, in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It is sown natural, it's raised spiritual. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. The first man, as the, and he says the connection to this idea goes back to Genesis. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is in the earthly, so also are those who are the earthly. As in the heavenly, so are those who are the heavenly. Do you know what side of that you're on? You are the earthly or the heavenly? Just as we born the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. You know how you get there? You know how you get there? you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. When you believe it, you receive it. 
You bear, the, you bear the image of the earthly. In Christ, you bear the image of the heavenly. Just think about that idea. Everything that Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God the Father, you are here on earth as a believer in Christ. He's a son, you're a son. He's eternal life, you're eternal life. He's an heir, you're an heir. He has an inheritance, you have that inheritance. And that list goes, he's a priest, you're a priest. And that list goes on. You know where you find it? In a little pamphlet that we have called 50 Things You Can Never Lose in Time and Eternity. You look over there to a section that's called the 20 Status Privileges in Christ. And that's your identity. With your feet on earth, this is who God sees. When he looks at your life, this is who you see. he sees. He sees you in Christ. And in Christ, you are all of those things. You need to get that little pamphlet and read it. And listen, this is who he sees you. This is who you should see yourself as. Stop letting other people define who you are or who you should be. Let the Lord Jesus Christ define who you are, and that's who you should be. You are a son of God. You're a, you are a beloved because he's the beloved. You're a beloved. That's who you are. You're a priest. You need to really read that. This is not who you're going to be. This is who you are now. In Christ is who you are. You need to live your life who you are in Christ. You got to know who that is to know who you are. Who are you in Christ? Are you not curious about that? Man, when I first time I heard that, I grabbed that like wildfire and I went, are you kidding? That's who I am? I thought I was this, this kid from Podunk, Michigan, the country kid. Well, I never knew why. This is who I am. That's who we are you in Christ, Ron Adema. That's who you are in Christ. And this is who you can be in this world. The world must never define who you are. You let God define who you are in Christ. The world should not define you. The world will call you some of the most ugly names you've ever heard in your life and then tell you they're all true. And they'll give you an example from your life why that's probably true. My, my, my. Do you have any idea who you are in Christ? See, I just, I pulled them right out of the air. I pulled them right out of there. You know why? Because they're in my soul. You need to know who you are in Christ, and you need to live that person. That's the person you need to be on the job, in the school. How can I do that, Ron? How, how, how can I do it? It's already been done for you. I, all you have to do is walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit will produce it. All you got to do is walk by faith and not by sight, and it will be produced, right? This is a grace program. This whole thing is about grace. Not asking you to make enormous changes in your life. We're asking you to live up to the changes that have already been made in your life. Do you get that? Only one person that doesn't want you to live the image of Christ. Guess who that guy is? Satan. He does not want you to mimic the life of Christ because it attracts people. Right? The real hurting masses of people in Moody in St. Clair County are looking for somebody that can give them the truth that can set them free from the bondage of their life. Don't stay into bondage. My, 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 people.
In the fallen humanity, the tree of life also provided eternal life to the perfect life of the human soul. Think about that. Think about that. They were in the garden. They Listen, they were in a perfect state of existence. They weren't saved. They didn't believe that Christ came, died for their sins, was buried and raised. They were created this way. It's only after they sinned that they have to go to, to the... To, to shadow Christology that said that Christ is going to die on a cross, shed his blood, and through that, the resurrection of Christ will bring you life. The tree of life was important to their existence. That's what we learn in Genesis. Listen to this phrase, because you missed it the first time I read it. In verse 22 of, of Genesis, I'm going I'm to fall back to Genesis Look at 3.22 with me. Look, look what God said in 3.22. Uh, 3.22. The man has become like one of us, doing good and evil. Now watch. And now he might stretch out his hand, watch this now, and take also. How about that? See, he had, he had liberty and freedom to go to the tree before the sin and not after it. What he was getting from the tree of life was a plurality of life. I'm going to show it to you. A plurality of life a, a, in a perfect state of person. A plurality of life spiritually and physically. How about that? Listen to the word. Now that he's committed his sin, God warns, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life. Has he proved, has he proved that he would do that before? Well, did he take from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Yeah. So he's got a pattern. He's not listening to God, is he? Listen to me now. Is he listening to God or is he listening to the devil? Listen to his wife. <laughs> Spoken by a man whose wife is not here. <laughs> you, bra you brave guy. Listen, and take also. See, those are, those are, those are very important words that he might stretch out his hand as he did before and take, take, take also. Say again. From the tree of knowledge. And listen, and what? what and do what? Live forever. live forever. And live forever. For you and I, this live forever now comes to a, a tree called Calvary or Golgotha where Christ hangs there and that's buried and raised from the dead to give us eternal life. Agreed? You've got to go through the gospel to get eternal life. Eternal life is in Jesus. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Oh. All right. Look, my, your job is to come. My job is to teach. I, I got no problem with that. Look at this. Here's how it works in your life and mine. Just like it has to work in Adam's after he sinned. You don't get eternal life any other way, Bubba. The testimony is this. God has given us eternal life, and this eternal life is in his Son. He who has the Son has eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. Watch this. I am writing these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You know, you know how you get it? After Adam's sin, you know how you get it? You get it through the gospel of Jesus Christ or you don't get it. And it wasn't true for them. It was only true after their sin. I gave you other passages on your paper worth your reading. Point number four, in Genesis 3.22, 
We are told two things that Adam and Eve discovered from transgressing the commandment, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're told two things they learned. First, they learned experiential truth. You, you know what experiential truth is? Is sitting in Bible study and getting your answers easy. <laughs> yeah, pretty easy. Just all you got to do is come sit and learn. You know the other way you learn it? Listen to me now. The hard knocks of life. You know, look, got to listen. He'll rub your nose in it. You can learn it the easy way in Bible study and cycle it according to 1 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Inhale, exhale the word of God in your life. You can learn it the easy way and walk by faith and not by sight. sight. Or you can learn it the hard way. You can learn it the hard knocks of life. And buddy, he'll teach you one way or the other. He'll teach it to you one way there because God cares more about your life than you do. You're willing to throw it away. You throw it away. Listen, there's two kinds of people who throw their life away. One throws it quickly and all of it, and the other, it's just nibbled away. Little by little by little by little, you just lose your life. You just throw it away. You've got to stop that foolishness, church. How are we going to meet, reach Moody, the St. Clair County, the state of Alabama, the United States of America? Do you think, do you think we have diapers full that need changing? My, my, my. And who's going to do that? The Church of Jesus Christ. We've got to step up to the plate. Stepping up to the plate means be who you are in Christ, in your personal life, with your wife and your children, your neighbors and other people. Bear, bear witness of your faith. Bear witness of your faith. Listen to the two things they learned. One, they learned experiential truth of the consequences of disobeying God's word. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing is the word yada. You remember um, Seinfeld, he used that word all the time, yada, yada, yada. The Bible uses it a lot too. Zakal infinitive. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing. You know how they learned it? Experiential. They, listen, they sat in class and learned it, right? Then couldn't apply it. <clears throat> couldn't cycle it through the faith system, right? When push comes to shove, right? They folded. Boy, don't be a folder. Play your hand, man. Play your hand and play it the best you can with God. Play your hand. The hand that God tells you, play it. Play it, play it with everything you got, and you'll be a winner. You're not going to lose. You're, listen, write this down. 1 John 5 4. 1 John 5 4. Where's the same victory is? Where's victory in the Christian life? Faith. Faith. You know what that is? That's a faith cycle. Hearing it, believe it, and applying it. First, first, they learned experiential truth of the consequences of disobeying God's word. Secondly, they learned the importance of positional truth. Listen to the positional. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and what? Because whoever ate the fruit got what? Got to live forever, right? Live forever. <clears throat> Point number five. In Genesis 3, 23 through 24, we learn the measures God took. Now watch this. Watch this. We learn the measures God took to prevent Ammon and Eve from eating from the tree of knowledge ever again. Watch the measures God took to prevent. In Genesis 
3.23, Moses wrote, Therefore, because of the transgression of Genesis 2.17, the Lord sent him out. Now I want you to watch something. I wrote P-I-E-L. Do you see that? P-L. In Hebrew, I want you to circle that little thing because, in, listen, that's intensive. When the P-L is used in the Hebrew, it's a way of showing you an, something that's really intense. Something really intense is going on. You know, you could, you could be sitting in a restaurant and everything's nice and quiet and everybody seems to have, and all of a sudden a commotion starts over there. And it's like an atmosphere changes where everybody gets, whew. you know what I mean? You ever been where there's a fight break out and everybody goes, whew. or somebody gets really loud and the furniture is starting to break and all that. It, it captures an atmosphere. You ever been in that? It captures an atmosphere. Right? That's the PL. <laughs> That's the PL. It's the PL in this case of drama. The PL of drama. Watch this. Therefore, the Lord sent him out. You understand that? And there was a lot of drama connected to it. I'm evicting you from the garden. <laughs> I know. You can cry on the other side of the garden. You can't look. You're evicted. <laughs> you understand that? There is drama connected to the eviction. You're being sent out. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this now. I'm going to send you away from the Garden of Eden. You're going to cultivate the ground. But you know, by now, the ground is cursed, right? Yes. Genesis, the third chapter, Genesis, the third chapter, 17 through 19, when he committed sin, the ground got cursed because he was taken from the ground. Agreed? The last time he cultivated it was as a piece of cake. Now it's warfare. Now he's got he's got to go out. He says, You're gonna go out and cultivate a terrible piece of ground. To cultivate the ground from which you were taken. Look at verse 24. Now watch 24, and then we're gonna take a break. Genesis 3 24. Watch that. So he drove. What, he brought a U-Haul it over and... No, no, no. This is drive him away. This is not he got a U-Haul and helped him move. This is evict evicting with his strong arm. And notice something. Do you see P-I-E-L? Wait, on your paper does it say... Drove out. I showed you the word. Does it say P I E L? You should circle that because that's a big what scene? A big drama scene, isn't it? I mean, they're holding, they're holding on to, you know, it was a, a bush or something. <laughs> they go, oh, yeah, let go. You got to go. What I'm telling you is a big drama scene twice. First, when he said, you're going to be evicted. And second of all, when he evicted him. Two big drama scenes. You know what it was about? It was about what they, were, what they had lost. The sense of loss in these two people. The sense of the loss of their spiritual part of their life. The sense of loss of the spiritual part of their life was overwhelming. What would God have to do in your life to get your attention? What 
what would he have to remove you from? That would just devastate your life. It would just break your heart. It would just throw you into a quandrum. It would cause you to have a, a drama scene every day of your life. What would that be? That's what I'm talking about. Listen, people, I need to have you think personally about this. He drove the man and the woman out east of the Garden of Eden and he stationed Hiffield. It's causative. He put a symbol of divine judgment at the door of the Garden of Eden. Hiffield, a cherubim and a flaming sword, <clears throat> a romphilia in the Greek. That's the big war sword. The flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. When we get to chapter 4, we're going to see another eviction from this famous family. How many evictions are we going to have to have where God is driving things out of our life that should normally be there because we don't have the good sense to take care of what he's given us? When we get to chapter 4, we'll see another major eviction that this family's got to go through. You're going to see tragedy in the life of this family. You're going to see a funeral and an eviction that will break your heart. How much of that do you have to go through to open your eyes to the spiritual truth of your life? This is not a hard decision for you to make. You choose the way of faith. You walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. You walk by faith and not by sight. These are easy choices for you to make. Why are you making them so difficult? I'll tell you why. Because you've got the devil whispering in your ear to go against the things of God. You're listening to that voice that's telling you to go against the will of God, just like he did in the garden. You've got to quit that stuff. This house is already occupied by the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. The, I, I said, go away. This house is occupied. Jesus Christ lives here in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual house. Go knock on somebody else's door. Not mine, because I'm not answering. That's the way it ought to be. It ought to be. Well, let's, let's have a word of prayer. The minute take the offering. We're going to take a break. We've got a 15-minute break. When we come back, we're going to come back to the book of Genesis. We're going to come back to the book of Revelation. We're going to look at this tree again. You will see this tree again. You will see this tree. Not in the Scripture. You'll actually see it. And I'll talk about that in the second uh, service. Father, we're so thankful. For these that have come and been so attentive in our study today on the tree of life in the period of innocence. Now we're going to see it, Father, in the new heaven and new earth as a great messianic trophy of victory. The tree of life. Ma, ma, ma. Take this offering we offer to you, Father. We are so thankful for the grace that you give us that we give to the ministry of this church to reach as far as we can to the uttermost parts of the earth. It is our duty, Father, to spend as little on ourselves as we can and most of it on reaching the lost with the gospel of Christ. I pray we would always have 
That is a marching order in our life as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.